John Serquera. Dude, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, John, I remember September 11th vividly, and I was in college. I walked out of a classroom, and there's a bunch of people huddled around a television monitor. And from then on out, for the rest of the day, I was glued to that TV. But you, on the other hand, were a little bit closer to the chaos that was happening 20 years ago. Can you go back to that day and tell me about that morning? I can. Uh, yeah. I had uh, just graduated college. So I graduated in May of 2001, moved up to New York in June uh, for a job that uh, was on the 81st floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. So on the morning of 9-11, our building was the first one to get hit by uh, by American Airlines Flight 11, I believe. And at the impact that set you know, the whole building scattering and after a time in uh, an office that had been dedicated to the local floor fire marshal, uh, we stayed there for a bit and then were guided to what seemed like the only open stairwell on our floor. And so uh, we went to the stairwell, moved from the 81st floor to the 67th floor quite quickly, uh, at which point I ran into my boss, my sales manager, Mike, and uh, we compared notes on what we had seen. He said our office was completely destroyed and mm -hmm. uh, that we were the last ones in the building. So uh, before we headed down, we heard other people in a hallway in the floor above where we were. So that was the 68th floor. And we went up there to tell them that the stairwell was open. And as we uh, ran into one group and guided them towards the stairwell, we saw another group behind them and then another group behind them. And then uh, towards the end of the hall was an office full of people that we could see through the glass doors and they weren't moving. Uh, so we banged on the doors to let them know that we found a way out and found out that the reason they weren't moving is because uh, they were trying to figure out uh, you know, the best way for the entire office to leave because one of their office mates was a wheelchair user. So uh, she was, uh, it was a, a woman in her, uh, in her forties and we saw her and offered our help. And so the three of us, the woman, Tina, my boss, Mike, and I headed back towards the stairwell and uh, made our way out of the building after about an hour or so, about five minutes before our building collapsed. And that was oh the day. Gosh. That's insane. So you heard people, you went back up a floor. So how did you guys actually carry this woman who was wheelchair bound? I mean, so you what, you carried her down 68 flights of stairs? Yeah, uh, there was actually an emergency wheelchair that had been installed in the office back in, as I understand it, in after the bombing in 1993. The office was equipped with an emergency wheelchair that was lighter than your typical motorized wheelchair and easier okay. to maneuver and had sled blades uh, where the wheels Ooh. would go so that they could move uh, more easily down the stairs. Wow. So then you yeah. just, you pushed her like as if it was a sled going down the stairs. Was there like one person in front, one person in back? Uh, there were different configurations, somebody in front, somebody in the back, a uh, person on either side. And, uh, you know, occasionally as we headed down the stairs, other people would, would join in to help. So I think that's, that's helpful context uh, because I think when, the story is told, there's an image of me alone or my boss, Mike alone, carrying some person over their shoulder and you know, all these, all these feats of strength. And it was, it was a little less dramatic than that. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you initially hear the story, you're like, okay, so, you know, John walks in and, and throws her over his shoulders and just starts sprinting downstairs, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, which, which obviously is a little bit different, but at the same time, it, it nonetheless is um, 
it's a heroic feat nonetheless and really speaks to just human nature and and the love and compassion that that humans can have for one another but i mean what was it like going down the stairs were you worried did you understand really what was happening or did you understand the severity of the situation those two questions i think the answers are not really to both of them really we knew that the building was on fire right. we were told that a plane had hit the building but there wasn't a lot of details in terms of motive uh, intent the scale of the attack we thought it might have been someone's private plane and they accidentally mm -hmm. clipped the building so what we knew was that there was a fire in our building and we needed to get out and there was likely to be debris falling from the building outside which is why initially we were told to stay in our building uh, because before the other plane hit tower two at, at that point the main concern was safety for the people below as debris fell from you know, those store those towers were about a quarter mile in the air so that was the concern and so that's what we thought we were escaping a fire that was slowly moving down the building we we had no thoughts about the building itself collapsing wow that's um that's interesting that they're telling you to stay in place and and it's hard to understand what you would do in in such a crazy traumatic chaotic situation and i would imagine that if you're being told like hey stay in place uh that the problems for the people down low where the debris is falling then that might be what you end up doing why why did you all of a sudden de determine that you had to get out of the building i mean did you really feel like this isn't exactly what they're saying this seems to be more unsafe yeah you know i wish i were uh more of an independent thinker at the time but uh honestly the direction we were given is what changed. So initially, when it was just our plane, uh, the, the plane that had hit our building, we were told, stay put. But that message shifted, as I understand it, looking back, when the other plane hit Tower 2. At that point, it became apparent that this was a coordinated attack and that you know, we didn't know what else was going to hit our building. And so I think at that point, that's when the direction shifted to don't stay here, get out as quickly as you can. So now this situation completely changes. There's a sense yeah. of urgency. There's obviously there's danger when there's a fire in a building and you're on the 81st floor, now the 68th floor. Um, yeah. But the urgency is is significantly different. And, and in a way, I mean, it's you want to look out for yourself. And I would imagine human nature is, I am in danger. I need to flee. I need to get out of here. Um, but you and your boss made a conscious decision to walk up a flight of stairs when you heard other people. What do you think it was within you or within your boss or within even the situation that made you think, you know what? Safety is down. Why am I going up to check on these people yeah honestly it it seemed like not that much bigger of a lift of a, of a feat it seemed very much like hey there all we have to do is go up this one half flight of stairs and yell at some people to, to get out and then we saw other people and then that became one additional minor incremental level of effort and so it, it wasn't this big epiphany of we've got to help and we're going to decide that uh, someone else's safety is more important than ours it was very much a an organic hey we should do this oh well now we should do this and now we should do this next thing and so it felt very much like just almost what was very natural to do yeah no, that's a curious that's a curious way to put that too because I'm I'm wondering if certain people are just wired that way, right? Like if if it's that whole nature versus nurture mentality. Like what is it about one individual that might 
um, take a second to stop and help someone else versus someone not even saying they're a better or worse person, just having the instinct to run in the different direction in, in terms of um, protecting yourself, right? And I don't know that anyone necessarily knows. I mean, do you, do you have any ideas on whether you feel like there's something about the way you were raised, about your experiences in life that made you, I don't know, predisposed to stop and help someone versus just the self-preservation? That's a hard question to answer. Uh, I don't know that I can point to anything in my background other than I, I was raised by two loving parents uh, where some version of altruism was was certainly respected. I remember hearing stories about my dad's dad passed away when he was nine, so I never met him. And the lore around him was of this gregarious, loving servant of sorts that even though they didn't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. the story was always around him helping where he could and uh, hosting people for parties, get togethers in a little tenement building in Newark, New Jersey. And I, maybe I just romanticized a, a part of that. But my, my parents are great people. My parents are helpers. My dad uh, served on different boards of community organizations growing up. And uh, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. You know, all of those, all those examples of reaching out and being a part of your community were certainly ingrained. Uh, I'd like to think that those are to to you know kind of be focused on as a as a reason why I thought to do that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, but who knows for sure, right? I yeah. want to get into. I love I love the idea of taking this idea of serving others and helping others and being of service and applying it to leadership. And I know I know that you have built a career on fostering leaders in business and, and working for a company that creates leaders within yeah. people. Um, and I do want to get into that. Just before we move on, I do want to hear just about the experience of bringing this woman down the stairs. Sure. And, you know, what? so what was it like with a group of people? What's going through your head as you guys are descending down 68 flights of stairs? And ultimately, what happens when you get out of the building? Yeah. So in the building, from the 67th floor down to around the mid 40s, the pace was quite slow. The, the stairwells were now packed with people. Mm -hmm. So we would move kind of landing by landing uh, very slowly. Uh, you know, at the time, there, there was this weird feeling of nobody was panicking. There was the somber mm -hmm. tone of, we're strangers, but we're all in some, clearly some crisis. And so yeah. uh, there were rumors around what was happening. Cell coverage was interrupted. So people were getting spotty messages from the outside. Uh, and so I would hear terms like kamikaze mission or you know, they, were, mm. they were opining that it was somewhere in the Middle East and that Saddam Hussein had done, was, was part of it. And there were all these rumors circulating. Uh, as we were moving down slowly, around the 40th floor is where we ran into firefighters who were coming up. And that was uh, that was an experience that that definitely seared into my memory because up to that point, no one was really sharing what was happening. And we were all doing our best to stay calm, but the the look of, kind of how severe and grave this scenario was really came off of the firefighters. And although they didn't wow. tell us much of anything uh, to not make people who couldn't do anything about it panic, uh, you could tell something was going on. And so at that point I got off to, uh, I got off on that floor and called my father. I wasn't able to get in touch with him when we were upstairs uh, on the 81st floor told him what was going on, told him where I was. He just told me to get out. And, uh, and he himself didn't give a lot of details. Now, looking back, it seems to not have me panic either. So right. we got back into the stairwell and 
the firefighters had set up a bit of a, a triage area on that floor and offered to uh, have uh, the woman we were with stay there. And we said, hey, you're welcome to do that, but we're, we're going now. And mm -hmm. she, that was the first time that I really heard her say, we, I want you to help. Uh, yeah. And that really kind of codified our mission. And now the tone was so far away from what was going to happen to us. And now we had a job, we had a purpose to serve. And so we headed back down the stairs. And uh, as we got a little closer to the bottom, the other building started collapsing. And we didn't know that's what was happening at the time, but I remember chaos in the stairwells and uh, one of the, the metal doors to the stairwell just flying open and flapping back Jeez. and forth on the walls like it was a, you know, a, a piece of paper. Uh, and so at that point, the stairwell grew completely dark and now we were being guided down the stairs by luminescent strips on the stairs. We got towards the bottom and uh, now we were, we were walking through a hallway, a dark hallway through water from the collection of sprinkler systems from a hundred floors or so uh, gathering where we were. And the firefighters were leading the way and were trying to get out the, the way that they came in and that way was blocked. So we oh were kind of stuck for a while uh, until that way was, was cleared and we exited into the lobby and saw the destruction uh, and just took in the scene and asked for more direction. And at that point, there wasn't a lot more direction that any firefighters were giving other than just get out however, however you can. So we exited out of uh, the West Side Highway entrance through a window, a broken window, and got out to the West Side Highway, uh, put the woman we were with in an ambulance and just surveyed the scene. Man. Obviously, you hear stories about that day and that morning and being in the building, around the building, just in New York City in general. And it's it's so powerful to hear it from someone who who was there experiencing it um, firsthand. And it's it's crazy. It's got to be tough. Is it tough to reminisce on it or no? Um, maybe, but there's a there's a slight distinction between my articulating the story and actively reminiscing on it. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Well, I've spoken, I've spoken about it you know, fairly regularly for the last 20 years. And so I've kind of organized how to describe the events in a way that makes sense to someone else. And it starts moving into almost a storytelling, a, a, a narrative that includes characters that, that, I have nothing to do with when I actively reminisce on it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bananas. It's just the, uh, what the perspective of being there that day where September 10th, the world seemed normal. And yeah. a day later, the world was unrecognizable in terms of what to expect and what was possible. And, how safe one feels and what your perspective is on humanity. So when I really reminisce, usually it happens when I see footage from that day or when I see a new perspective. There was a, a documentary that was out a few years ago and it was strung together audio recordings from that day, 9-11 calls or 911 calls and uh, different CB calls. And to hear that perspective, to, to get thrown into a new set of insights around how other people were reconciling with just this rapid change of events and this world changing experience, that, that sticks. Yeah. So what, what, changed perspective wise on September 12th what did you learn about the world that was proven untrue on that day 
huh? What did I learn about the world that was proven untrue? Uh, the first thing I remember was, I can't believe we're living in a scene that looks like it's from an action movie. Mm -hmm. The it, Growing up as a kid, I'm sure you did this, you'd watch movies around adventure and action and war movies and you'd play, you'd, you'd, you'd play act that with your friends. And I remember routinely, you know, my dad saying some version of that's not really how it happens or my mom saying, you know, that's just make believe. And so in my mind, I was thinking all of that type of chaos is just make believe it's it's Hollywood magic. And that day I, I saw one of the most iconic buildings and and areas in the world going through that. And so just seeing something that seems so unlikely coming to realization just made you think, well, what, what the heck else can happen? So that I remember that being the first thought. Second thought was beyond the witness of pure evil, we saw so much goodness come from, a, 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 before that time, a, a really unlikely source. Right? New Yorkers mm -hmm. have been routinely considered one of the, the more rude groups of people throughout the world. And that day, they and we were anything but. It, there was very much a teamwork effort that, that codified the city and that codified the country and then codified the world. And that was, that was almost equally as bizarre to see that many people focusing on that you know, just one event with just such heartfelt love and, and compassion. Yeah. So what, what emotion is it that really comes to your mind when you reflect on it? Is it like this anger for the evil that was happening? Is this this pride of humanity? Is it, what's the emotion that really kind of hits you when you reflect on it? Oh, man, it's both of those. When I, when I think about the, the, actual events the de the the attack yeah there's there's a lot of anger there's sadness there's just such there's my heart goes out to the people that were going through it at the time when mm -hmm. i see videos of me as a 22 year old my heart goes out to the 22 year old version of me because i i see other you know other 20 somethings now that i work with uh you know that are in our community and i'm just thinking these people look like kids and yeah. how are kids involved in that? And so that's where you start thinking through, you know, not just kids in terms of 20 somethings, but you know, those images of a daycare, not too far from, from the building and parents trying to get in touch with their, with their families. I mean, it just makes me so sad and scared for them in retrospect. So I think it's, it's really more that it's the sadness. It's the, fear it's just the just just the 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 tragedy of it all just comes in when i see the stories from afterwards i mean the afternoon of i'm filled with such pride for how the collective consciousness can turn into this overwhelmingly positive approach yeah it's it's really crazy to think about the journey you've been on. And and one of the things that I love that you've done with your life is that you really have dedicated it to helping other people get into the mindset of someone that has gone through this experience. And you obviously lived it, but it's like what many people say, I don't want you to have to go through what I went through to be able to learn the same experiences. And And now as a as a leadership consultant, as a manager, as, as just a dad, as an individual who wants to increase the collective goodness in the world. What do you think you learned about leadership from this experience? Wow. Uh, honestly, and you can, you can edit this out. I don't know that it was necessarily about leadership. Um, but what I what I learned from this experience is 
there is a lightness and an alignment that one feels when you are serving someone else. Mm. When you invest your energy in service, in love, love as a verb, mm. uh, in a way that ignores what you get out of it, you become a channel this sounds hokey, but almost a channel of divinity. You are you are helping someone else with no regard for your own well-being, and you start emanating this goodness. And I felt that. The problem is that motivation to serve others is hard for us when we're concerned in day to day what we get out of it right mm -hmm. so what i've learned is not just the value and the and the feeling of alignment of serving because that's been that's been well documented and I, and the company i work with now aslan we're a sales training and management coaching firm and that's that's really the premise of what we teach that you're more powerful and influential as a salesperson as a leader, when you are pursuing, uh, you know, a, a positive outcome for somebody that's that's not you. So that that is something with which I've been familiar. What happened after that series of events is I went back to regular life, and the playbook I had for regular life, and what the playbook that most people have for regular life tells them to. Work on those elements that are, or you know, that that what the elements on which natural selection relies, right? Yeah. Competition, survival, and and reproduction, perpetuating our genetics, and that goes into making sure that our kids are the version of ourselves that we want to present to the world, and that's the playbook most of us have. I pursued efforts that followed that playbook. And when I pursued efforts that were around competing and surviving and, and kind of egotistical based efforts, I was less fulfilled. When I pursue efforts that are born out of serving other people and emanating good, I feel more fulfilled. And so I started kind of thinking through how do I reset myself when I'm working on this playbook of ego and competition and survival that is ingrained in us through evolution, how do I detect when I'm in that pattern and I'm starting to kind of work down this downward spiral? And then how do I get myself out of it? And that's where I've been focusing a lot more of my energy in speaking and speaking and coaching as of late. I love this. And I think your experience is, is perfect for this mindset, this ideology, because what I'm hearing you say is you had a traumatic experience that that highlighted the importance of love, of kindness, of self, of selflessness. And then like so many people who have a realization, you get back to your norm and you say, okay, I, I'm now going back to what I'm used to. I'm um, self-preservation, make that money, um, perpetuate the human race, whatever it may be. Um, but you, you now have decided or you've realized ways to detect that you're in this negative cycle and you can bring yourself out of it, which is so important. So how can someone who is in this cycle detect that they're being selfish or there may not be selfless focused um, to start to work their way back out of it. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Uh, you know, for for me, it happened after a few examples where I was really trying to grasp. And mm -hmm. when we grasp, and this was for me in a professional context, took a role that wasn't a bad role, wasn't with a bad company, but the reason I was doing it was looking back was for our, my own self aggrandizement right my my own mm. power and ego and the money i was going to make and and uh the position that i played and after that experience 
I realized uh, during the experience I was unfulfilled, after the experience I was unfulfilled, and I thought back to what, what made me do that? How could I avoid that? And how could other people avoid that? Because I see other people getting spun out when they're too focused on themselves. That, that grasping, uh, the, the core tenet of, you know, of Buddhism is, is suffering is driven by attachment. Suffering is driven, and in that, in that context, suffering is you know, uh, another proxy for what we consider depression, mm. anxiety, uh, dissatisfaction. All of that's organized around, I need my thing. And until I get my thing, I'm going to be unhappy. And then when I get my thing, here's what I don't think a lot of people recognize. Even when I get my thing, if my thing is just meant to serve me, when I get it, I don't really want it anymore. So and I true. realize that that's not going to fulfill me. And so the first step is helping people to recognize that that is the case. Right? That yeah. this path to getting what we want, which is so distracting, distracting and it's so attractive it looks like that's the only path to go. And, and when you see people who get that and are still unhappy, it makes you stop and say, well, maybe, maybe we're pursuing the wrong stuff. And so first yeah. there's a realization that that is a condition. And, you know, I could show people different examples of that being the case. And it doesn't mean that you don't work on your professional life. It doesn't mean that you don't achieve goals. It's just that you adjust your relationship to them and adjust what your motive is. Is pursuing those goals a form of serving yourself or is pursuing those goals some means to making other people's lives better? So first is recognize that that's where you go. Then it's helping people to recognize that even though that might sound good and exciting and you know it makes you want to gravitate towards that level of compassion, it's helpful to recognize that, look, it's hard to do that when we're in a state of feeling like we don't have enough and feeling like we don't have the gifts to give or that we're not going to get the gifts to give. So there's recognizing when you're in those kind of stressful scenarios where you're going to be inclined to keep grasping and serving yourself. So I'll help people with exercises on, hey, let's think through scenarios or circumstances where you feel like there's no other option but to serve yourself and where you're grasping. And then let's think about how that feels. Do you feel better or worse when you're serving yourself to try to, you know, either collect resources or sometimes it's revenge. Sometimes it's being right. It's winning an argument. And let's recognize that and let's stop for a second and don't worry about what you don't have or what you don't have yet. Let's focus on gratitude, right? Gratitude yeah, so... is the first step. Yeah. So how do, how, what kind of exercises are, are these? Because this is, this is important because I really feel like if someone is in this cycle, they're likely not aware. Um, and they might, they might not, because no one's like, oh, I'm being selfish right now. It's, it's really hard to kind of be aware and say like, oh yeah, I'm out grasping. It's money grasps. It's success grasps. So how do you bring this actual awareness um, to somebody who may be grasping? Yeah. I mean, the, I'm not going, I don't, I don't purport to go out to the street and say, hey, you with the briefcase and the power tie, by the way, I'm using pre-COVID uh, yeah. pre um, imagery of the, the prototypical rat race person. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going out to grab people on this. What I am finding is there, there's a population of people who are dissatisfied and communicating that they're dissatisfied and they're feeling like there's something out there that's better. Yeah. And for that group who says, I'm dissatisfied and I feel like there's somewhere out there better, I say, cool, would you like to hear a perspective and let's see how much of that perspective applies to you. And it becomes almost this self-diagnosis that I can help through, uh, help with is, Okay, you're dissatisfied because why? Well, you're not getting that promotion. Okay, why do you need that promotion? Who's not getting it for you? you know, yes. What does that feel like? <clears throat> what steps can you put into place? What are your expectations? And when we can start separating the expectations and control from 
what you can just kind of move in a direction for the, that that moves you forward when we separate what you get out of it to what you need to do for it now we can start talking about well what's your motive why are you why are you pursuing this is it for you or is it for somebody else because if it's just for you let's think through how fulfilled you've been when you've only served yourself and let's think about scenarios where you've been where you've served others and what does that feel like my gut yeah. is that you'll feel more powerful when you think about the scenarios where you serve somebody else. Yeah. So you've talked about, and the words that you're using is purpose and motive. And, and then also you're talking about like accomplishments and what people are able to achieve. So I'm curious. Um, it seems as though having like a, a why or a purpose or a mission is super important in terms of like really taking a step back, being aware and aligning your actions with your expectations of what you'll get out of it. Am I right in saying that? And if so, yeah. um, then how do we, how do we create a purpose that's maybe not, uh, and I, I don't even want to put a negative spin on it, but how do we create a selfless purpose and still like achieve and provide for ourselves and our family? Great. That's a great question. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a term in kind of Eastern philosophy. It's called karmic yoga. And it's the idea that really uh, within reason, anything we do, if we're doing it for the betterment of other people can be an act of service, can be an act of love. And so it really does get to what is your motive? Uh, you know, obviously stealing is not good, right? Anything that, that represents basic sin is not good, but basic sin, you know, your, your seven deadly sins, if you look at them, they're all sins because they're all about serving yourself and creating separation between you and others, mm -hmm. right? So you know, whatever your efforts are, even the the prototypical self-centered uh, effort of I'm going to start a company. I want to make a lot of money. Great. Well, who are you serving along the way? And what are you going to do with that money? Is it so you collect it for yourself and you just watch all your money and feel power? Or is there some purpose that serves others along the way or even at the outcome? So I think that's the, that's the distinction between it can be anything. We need on this earth, people in multiple different roles. Uh, you know, we need we need people in in you know what are considered high level money making scenario uh, positions, and people that are maybe less recognizable and feel like they're not making as much of an impact. But any of those efforts, if you're doing that with some motive of I'm doing it to conduct this energy for others, can become an act of service. Yeah, this is this is really important because I've. I've struggled with this a little bit, not in terms of like my career, but just trying to understand it. And maybe you can shine some light on it as well. But I've always, <clears throat> I've never felt like, um, and I guess I'm a capitalist at heart too, sure. because I've never felt like businesses or individuals that make a lot of money are necessarily like doing bad things. You know, you have your occasional Bernie Madoff who's swindling money away from folks. And look, there's, there's, you know, professional criminals, I guess, that may be doing well for themselves in terms of accumulating um, assets or, or money. But generally, if you've made a lot of money, you could talk about the Steve Jobs and Warren Buffetts and all these financiers. They're generally doing a service. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, Steve Jobs was rich. Jeff Bezos is rich. He can fly himself to space. <laughs> right. You right. know, like that's, there's a lot of money in just starting a space company and going to space on a whim, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, like Amazon is a ridiculous service. And as much as I, I love supporting local business, dude, I can have one click of a mouse and like, anything in the world shows up at my house in two days. Yeah. How yeah. great is that? And accumulating wealth when you're providing a service, all that's allowing you to do is to scale that impact 
at yeah. a fast level. So I don't think that everybody has to say, okay, well, I want to live like a selfless monk life and just give everything back and not make money. I think there's yeah. a way to align purpose and selflessness in capitalism. There is. I mean, there's two concepts come to mind. Uh, one is this idea that uh, there is something called right income. There's a term called right mm -hmm. Right income, which is kind of speaks to you know, who am I to say that Jeff Bezos doesn't deserve his money? Now, I do have some questions around whether he needs all that money and is he doing enough with it to serve the world? But but it's it's not me to say. It's not my it's not my perspective to to impose upon anybody else. But if his purpose is I want to create a way where Everybody, regardless of where they are, can have access to basic goods and services, and I can facilitate commerce from you know, small businesses or large businesses who, who are creating shareholder value for other people. And that means that I'm doing such at a scale that this is the income that comes out of it. But your purpose is I want to connect everybody, make sure they have what they need. Awesome. Right. Conversely, if the purpose is I just want to be this rich, maniacal, evil genius and just fly myself to space so that as the, as the earth burns, uh, I've got somewhere else to go, uh, then, then you would look at that from a different perspective. But even the, gosh, even the space program that he's putting together that's come with a lot of criticism, guess what? If it's an ego project that says, look how rich I am, I can go to space, I might look at that with a little bit of a uh, kind of a darker shadow to it. But if the if the purpose is, I think there's some exploration that's due in space. And if we can get it more privatized, maybe we'll have more options at our disposal and perpetuate the whole human race. Cool. And, and so I think it's it's really the the perspective, the motive that that should be taken a look at. Like you, right? You're doing a podcast. Are you doing it for you know, if you're doing it because you want just clicks and likes and you want to be this, you know, this persona who's regarded in a positive way for your own ego that might put a little discount on the on kind of the the value creation but if what you're doing is taking your story where you've gone through some pain and you feel like other people who are going through pain would benefit from hearing it and you're trying to do that at a scale that makes sense again same action different motive and and changes you know how how it might be regarded yeah well john obviously i just want to get rich and go to space Right. I want that for you. I want that for you. For whatever reason you want, by the way. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's a really good point, though. And um, look, money, it, it, it it's crazy because it does highlight people's motives in so many ways. And I think it's it's also fair to say, like, yeah, Bezos is rich is because Amazon is providing such a phenomenal service. So I love the idea of like right money you know, who are we to say what he needs to do with it? I feel, I still think we can take a step back and say, well, yeah, he's accumulated a lot of money, but it's also directly correlated to the success of Amazon in terms of what it is doing to serve humanity in a lot of ways yeah. too. Um, I'm curious to, to hear how you think um, 9-11 changed your uh, perception of the human race and people in general? Hmm. I would say it, it changed my perception of the human race in what, in that there's so much going on in our heads and our hearts and our souls that can shift our behavior in in sometimes really unpredictable ways that's that's what i've seen uh, mm. you know i don't know what at the moment com compelled me and my boss to to do something differently i don't know i can't feel the the source of a motive that would make hijackers fly a plane into a building like based on based on what a source of pain a source of you know, hoping that the world is is changed in their image. Uh, I don't know what goes through people's minds or hearts when they 
you know, lose a loved one in such chaos, in such uh, what, such notable worldwide tragedies like that, and that that you know has spurned a lot of people to be angry and driven a lot of the division in the country, right? I mean, so much of our now political climate was organized around the ideas of retaliation for those events. And that's created division and other factions. And, uh, and so it's just the, the human experience is just a mystery to me. And that day just showed me the different, the different dimensions of that. Uh, and I think that's where my motive of trying to get in the mind of somebody who feels like they need to be just serving themselves and grasping for themselves. Like, that's what kind of drives me to say, hey, there's there are a few triggers in one's mind that if you just look at it slightly different, uh, you might find that you can be on a path to a greater level of fulfillment versus chasing the next thing until you get that thing and don't want it and have to chase another whole thing. If you were working with someone and you wanted to help them get on that path to greater fulfill fulfillment, what are three things they can do today to get on that path? Yeah. Love that question. Uh, you know, a cycle that's worked for me and that I've turned into uh, kind of my my daily mantra is gratitude, love, and abundance. Mm -hmm. When I feel like I'm getting spun out, when I feel like I don't have enough, or when I feel like I'm going to grasp for another thing, which is another way to say I don't have enough because I need that other thing. First step to get myself out of that pursuit is to stop and think about what I do have, right? That's the gratitude. I can't pour from an empty cup if I know that I should serve and that's the path of fulfillment, that's great. But what if I feel too insecure to do that? What if I don't feel like my basic needs are going to be taken care of? And so mm -hmm. stopping and looking at what do I have already? Uh, and, and the simpler, the better, right? The simpler I can get on what I have, the more powerful it becomes, right? It's the difference in saying, I'm grateful for my brand new car versus I'm grateful for the fact that I get to take in breath or whenever I want. So, so there's the idea of you know, listing out things that, that you're grateful for, finding the, t the places where you're going to get spun out and where you feel like you're most likely to want to start grasping in advance of those scenarios happening, writing down, hey, is that going to happen? And when it does, what can I stop and be grateful for right now or, right, or at that point and remind myself of that? Second yeah. piece is in, in terms of love. Right? Love as a verb. Where can I serve? That can be ranging from uh, what doing your typical kind of nonprofit work, soup kitchens, food banks, tutoring, to maybe it's just being a lending or lending a, a helping hand to someone you know that needs help, but in your personal circle. It could be finding that as a vocation. I have friends that are EMTs, firefighters. You could do it as your job or you can do it in your job. At Aslan, we teach people how within their job to serve other people. And so starting in a what you can do this week, list out your unique gifts and find where those unique gifts might be of value and go find a place to serve and, and see what that feels like. And then the last part is the idea of abundance. Right? And, and abundance is important because if we serve with an expectation of getting something, we take the shine off of that service. If we love with the main motive of being, of having that love reciprocated, then we get to a point where we're expecting something to happen. And that expectation starts driving us to be a little more self-centered. Why don't I have this thing? If we can recognize that we should be loving kind of freely without an agenda, without reciprocity, because we will be taken care of if we find the cycle if we if we find a place where we can run the cycle that abundance will be self-evident because if we're acting in that way we're creating a world that's better that we get to live in 
And we don't have to wait for the person we served to thank us or to give us the thing back. We'll be taken care of. Uh, that is powerful. I love that. I love that. Um, do you think that you've kind of had this realization of gratitude, love, abundance from being confronted with mortality? It, it could be mortality. <clears throat> I would say it's mortality in terms of the finite nature of life and feeling like I only have a certain amount of time to get my things done, right? So there was the idea of, I've only got a certain amount of time to get my things done, so I better hurry up and get it. But then when I think about mortality, you think about, well, when this whole thing's done, this whole, this whole life on earth is over, how do you measure success? And it's not going to be based on getting all your stuff. It's going to be based on you know, how well did we serve? How much time did we spend on activities that made us a, more aligned with what our overall purpose is? And, and I think that's where when I see the motive of mortality says, I only have this much time to get my thing, but then how unfulfilling the pursuit of just getting your thing is and how unfulfilled you'll feel if at the end of your life, that's all you spent your time doing. That's what kind of started to shake me up a bit and say, hey, yeah, there's that, gotta be a better way. No, that's that's interesting. I never really thought about it this way, but uh, as you're speaking, I'm thinking like mortality, and you, the way you kind of described it made it seem as though mortality in and of itself is like this this finalness to an individual, but it's really internal, right? Like okay, I am dead. Right now, I am done. Me, Ryan Shuckle, um, John, you are done when it's mortality. But then you're kind of getting away from that and you're saying, well, if you're serving others, then even when you're confronted with your own mortality, maybe your life isn't over. Maybe you leave a legacy. Maybe what you've done here in the time you've had is just the beginning. It's this contribution to humanity, to other people that you love, to your career, to just anything. Maybe you don't die, right? And, and maybe that is like some Eastern philosophy, but I mean, what, what kind of legacy in that regard then do you want to leave for, for others and, and for your daughter? Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, a great, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm reluctant to go too far down a religious path, but notable schools of thought that include religion, that include even super secular psychology or the most secular versions of psychology, all extol the virtues of getting out of yourself by considering the bigger picture, mm. right? So as you talk about mortality, if you want to go down a spiritual path, that's the idea that your life, your energy, your soul goes beyond the, the, the finite experience of your body on this earth. And that becomes an idea of, hey, if I'm going to think of myself, my soul, my personality as, as this current of energy, that energy doesn't necessarily have to end with, with my body. And so if I can start practicing being aligned with that energy of the universe, God, nature, whatever word you want to use for it, uh, that's that's super powerful. If you don't want to go in, down that path and you just want to consider that the, the earth is billions of years old and that came out of a big bang and we're in the cycle of expansion and contraction, you can live in that space and say, guess what? Of millions of years, you're 85, 87 years on this earth. If that's all you're worried about, you might want to look at a bigger picture right? and that can start helping. And and so as you ask, what legacy do I want to leave? I'd love to leave a legacy of a recognition that if I get into the cycle of love, of, love is a verb, love is service. It's not just for what I think we've all been taught about doing 
on to others, right? It always felt like doing unto others was just so that you can maintain society. Hey, do a nice thing for them because that's just what neighbors do because we want to keep society going. What I, what I don't think has been given enough airtime is the idea that if you serve, if you do unto others as you would have done to you and even better, you don't have to wait for that reward. That exercise, right? That exercise can bring you into alignment right now. It's not this delayed gratification. You can do that now and make the world in which you live better almost immediately. And if it's not immediate, the continual effort will over time yield better results than not. Yes. That's, uh, uh, that's such a beautiful way to look at the world in general. You know, John, this has been so much fun and, and we could go on forever and ever and ever about a lot of this. Um, but how can people find you? How can they learn more about your story? How can, if they're looking for a way, if they're grasping out there and they want to reach out to you, how can they do so? Yeah, uh, I can be reached at uh, my my work address is John C at AslanTraining.com. J-O-H-N, the letter C at AslanTraining.com. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, John Sequeira. Last name, C-E-R-Q-U-E-I-R-A. Uh, I'll have a website uh, up shortly around kind of being more intentional about some of the speaking. I've been doing it on request and uh, I, I think we'll, we'll spend a little more time making that an official offering. Absolutely. Well, I have three questions that I ask everybody at the end of every single podcast, and I'm excited to get your answers for those three questions. So, John, what is the most impactful book you have ever read? Ooh, most impactful book I've ever read. I'm between a few. I'll say this. I, this is this is maybe not the most, but it's what's on my mind right away. Uh, have you heard of the Tao of Pooh? I have heard of it. I have not read it. So the Tao Te Ching is, is the seminal work of Taoism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tao Te Pu is an exercise in, or, or it's, a, it's a book that highlights the story of Winnie the Pooh and his friends in terms of uh, Taoism and, and how Winnie the Pooh is kind of the, the quintessential demonstration of Taoist principles. And it uses the other characters in the book as, uh, as kind of examples of human tendencies that don't serve us. So, you know, Tigger is uh, overly energetic and wants to do all the time. Eeyore is kind of always depressed and negative and so on and so forth. Rabbit's a little too clever, but not wise. Uh, and it's just a really, it's a fun tongue in cheek unexpected way of exposing uh, someone to some, what, what I think are really helpful tenets of, of life. That sounds awesome. I, yeah. I'm going to get off here and get that immediately. That sounds like <laughs> such a cool, uh, like a metaphoric book. I, I think that sounds really, really cool. It is. If, it came out like, it came out in the eighties. It was something that like I, I, different friends of mine in different circles, as I've read it, we're like, oh yeah, of course, everybody read that. Like, well, I didn't read that, and it's just it's become canon in certain circles. It's 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 really interesting. Man, if you could have a drink with anyone, past or present, who would it be? What would you drink, and why? You know, this sounds this sounds really cliched, I know, but uh, George Washington in like the pre-revolution, like I mean, in early George Washington in in you know colonial New York in like a time where that just you know it was so raw and and you know there was a new country forming, almost in the form of a startup. Uh, I, that would just be, I mean, I don't know if he'd have a lot of, a lot of things to say to me 
at, at, at certain points in his life, but I think that'd be super cool. And I'd love to meet him in some old tavern and drink, I don't know, what do they drink? Ale, beer, mead, whatever they were drinking back then. I would love to drink that in an old tavern. That you know, it's funny you say that that's cliche. I've done over 40 podcast episodes, probably recorded over 45 at this point. I've never had George Washington as a response, so I love that. Really, that, that's phenomenal. Um, so and then you know, this the, the Every Breath Counts podcast is all about gratitude, it's about optimizing your mind, your body, your career, your life, it's breaking past barriers and it's achieving as much as you can within your own control and just living a fulfilling life. So how do you, John Sequera, on a daily basis, make every breath count? That that's an easier one for me. Thanks for giving me, thanks for giving me at least one one easier one. <laughs> I have a reminder in my phone for the t- at the time where I know I'm going to be taking my morning coffee, somewhere between 6.45 and 7.30. And it is my mantra of gratitude, love, and abundance. It just starts my day on recognizing just the, the magic of life that, I- that I'm afforded, regardless of how the rest of the day goes the love piece puts my mind in a state where depending on what I have going on that day, I'm looking for ways where I can help somebody else. Even if it's just, you know, giving a good intention, calling somebody to thank them for something, call them to let them know that I'm thinking about them or it's active service. How do I set up the house so that when my family comes down from, uh, from upstairs, it's in a way that's going to get everybody's day started. Or am I doing some project at work where work can always be kind of a a source of potential stress, but how do I do that with grace and service? Uh, And so that's where, that's where I'll focus my, my attention. And the abundance is this idea of trust, right? Not that it doesn't matter if I show up that day, but Hey, regardless of what I do in the long run, it's going to work out and and I've got to release the attempt to control every little thing. And if, if I set my day that way and think about my day that way by employing those elements, I, I know my day is better than when I don't. Absolutely. It's intentional. It's intentional. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. I love everything you live for. I love what you're doing. I, I think there's a lot of people that are grateful to have you in their life. And I can't wait to see what you do in the future. I'm excited to hear more of your speaking. I can't wait to see how you're going to roll out some of these workshops. Guys, if you want to reach out to John, if you want to hear him speak for your company, or you just want to uh, be abreast of the workshops he's going to be put out, follow the link in the show notes, email him, enjoy the rest of your week, have gratitude, love and serve others in abundance and make every breakfast.